Good afternoon, everyone. I just had an extraordinary privilege to be hung by, not hung, hugged by, hugged by a room full of four-year-olds. I can't tell you how wonderful that feels, uh, the innocence, uh, the trust, and uh, the sense that I got as a mother. I recognize that these children are well cared for, and they love being here. They all told me they had pizza. It's a Friday. That's part of their tradition. And I realized why these places are so important. Uh, just to give these children that socialization, which is so important, especially after two years of isolation. Some of them would have been two years old when that started. And so uh, it's really good to be here. And I'm, I want to thank the Hebrew Educational Society, HES, for the incredible work you do here. And Moshe Rifkin, I want to thank the executive director for all the great work you do every single day. Also, our, I'm joined by our commissioner, Sheila Poole, an extraordinary individual who's so passionate. We have traveled the state together uh, long before I became governor, focusing on the needs of our families and children. So let's give Sheila Poole, our commissioner, Office of Child and Family Services, a round of applause. And things get done in Albany when you have great partners. And you are so fortunate to have the elected officials here on the stage representing you. And let me start with Senator Roxanne Prasad, who I've known for many years. Uh, she is, she and I have done a lot of, a lot of, lot of child, their child care events, uh, focusing on the needs of the working families and the children, particularly those from underserved communities. And so I want to thank her for her leadership in Albany, as well as our partner in the assembly, Jamie Williams, again, another true leader. So I just want to welcome them here today. Let's see. But we're here today to talk about how we in government are giving working parents and families, particularly moms, the support they need. And we saw for far too long that we've had a child care crisis in this country. To all the providers in this room, I thank you, but I'm not telling you something you don't already know. This is not a pandemic occurrence or an outgrowth of the pandemic. It predated the pandemic. We know this that for too long there's been child care deserts, there have been barriers because of lack of affordability or access, and we knew that this was finally a time who's come to really drill down and address these needs. And we saw again during the pandemic, children who'd normally be occupied in a child care center or in a school setting, all of a sudden they're back home. And if you're one of the parents who were able to zoom in to work, it wasn't easy, but you might have been able to just figure it all out. But those parents, particularly those from black and brown communities who were the essential frontline workers, who could not zoom into their jobs, who showed up still serving people in hospitals, caring for them, running our transit, our bus drivers, people worked in the restaurants that fed us food even if we picked it up at the curb, they didn't have an option. And I remember asking the question early in the pandemic. In fact, I wrote about it in March of 2020, just a few weeks after the pandemic started. I said, who's watching the children? These are working parents. Who's watching their kids? And at that moment, I realized there were still a lot of real heroic people during a scary time, the uncertainty about their own safety. We had health care, we had child care providers showing up at their sites and taking care of the children of the essential workers. They became the essential workers for the essential workers, in effect. And no one properly recognized that, but I saw it even back then. And I'm not going to state something we don't know, but most times in child care, the burden falls on women. And we started seeing that so many women were not able to return to jobs because they didn't have that child care. And it affected their family economically. It affected their ability to build up money during a time when there was great need. They couldn't earn a dime, many of them. And as the first female governor of the state of New York, I'm also the first mom governor of the state of New York. And that gives me a unique perspective to know that, yes, it's society's, um, society has long 
thrusts the responsibility of childcare on the women, and they are the ones the most affected when there is a shortage of affordable childcare. So a lot of women left the workforce. Still, a lot of women have not returned to the workforce, and that hurts our economy as well, not just their personal family finances, but it affects our economy as well. And I predicted back then that women could face a generational setback if we don't start solving for this right now. So I said back then as Lieutenant Governor and now in a position as Governor, we can no longer turn our eyes away from what has really just shown up so vividly, the crisis that families, particularly moms, are going through and who is watching their children. So I had an opportunity as we put together my first budget this year, because a budget is not just a cold document with a lot of numbers in it. It's your ability to state your priorities in a way of doing more than just saying, well, we want to solve this and talking a good talk about it. It's also putting the money where your mouth is. And so that's exactly what we did in this budget, and I'm very proud of it. And again, I want to thank our legislators for being our partners and working together to reach a, a solution that we still believe is going to transform families' lives. So today I'm very proud to come to this site and announce that we are now going to be distributing $2 billion in child care subsidies for families and providers. This is the largest investment in child care in the history of the state of New York. And let me break this down for you. This is nearly $900 million in new funding passed by the budget for this year, more than $500 million in funds previously allocated, and an additional $600 million in pandemic funding. And it's investing now in a profound, transformative way in our families, in our children, and our providers, and our providers. It was just the right thing to do. None of us even asked a question. We knew we had to do this. And I think it's going to go a long way toward our economic recovery as well for those families where moms will finally have a place where they know their children are safe so they can get back on with their lives, help bring that money into their families and allow them to continue in their jobs or their careers. And what this is is also a statement of our priority as New Yorkers, who we value. We value our kids. We value our families. We value our child care providers. So we, this $2 billion we're announcing today is just the beginning because we have put together a package that will result in the delivery of $7 billion over the next four years for child care in the state of New York. We're also increasing the eligibility thresholds for child care subsidies, uh, going from 200% to the poverty line. And there was talk around the team about, why don't we increase it to 250% of the poverty line, lift people up a little bit more? I said, no, how about 300%? Let's do 300%. So $82,000, up to $82,000 families can get help, helping our middle class families for a family of four. Uh, and that'll open the door to literally hundreds of thousands, about 400,000 more children will be eligible for child care subsidies. That's extraordinary. That is extraordinary. That changes lives. But we also know we need to do more for our providers. And just last night, we closed the portal, accepting applications for new child care providers to open up programs across the state, particularly focused in the child care deserts. We know where they are. We know exactly where they are. And I am delighted at the resounding response we had to this solicitation for applications. We had 1,700 applicants last night at the close of midnight, and we are going to be reviewing them and over a short time announcing who those providers are. So we also want to make sure that we have stabilization grants. We're announcing our second round for $343 million of stabilization grants. And that goes right to the providers, the ones that were hardest hit. It's for them and for their employees. And I have met many of the employees of our child care providers, 
and they are doing God's work. They become the moms and the teachers and the social workers and the mental health experts. They take care of all their problems, even though they're young, but especially after this pandemic. We saw how the isolation and the disruption of their everyday little lives, even though they haven't even been here that long, it had a possible possibility of a long-term impact if we don't capture this right now and recognize we have to help these kids heal. And that is a, the weight that's on the shoulders of these incredibly hardworking childcare providers. So 75% of that 343 million will go directly toward workforce support in terms of wage increases, bonuses, tuition reimbursement, and help toward their own retirement and health care plans. We have to take care of them so they can thrive in these jobs, so they can continue coming back. It just makes sense. And also, we're expanding our high-quality child care by increasing the child care market rate to include 80% of providers that will broaden the child care options and available for subsidy families while increasing the reimbursements, as well as we need more money to build the facilities. So we're going to have $50 million in capital grants to construct or to renovate and expand existing facilities. So how does that one sound? Um, so we're not just stopping there. You know, these parents need help, but guess what? When you think about it, a lot of parents are just trying to lift themselves up as well and get an education so they can get a job that will bring more money to their family. We understand that. But how does a working parent further their education when there's no one to watch their kids? The cost of having the kids plus the tuition, it doesn't add up to help cover the cost of what they hope to eat to hope to earn. So you just do the math real quick there. It doesn't work for them. So how do we solve for that? I'm proud to say that our budget has $15.6 million in startup funding to establish child care centers on all the remaining SUNY and CUNY campuses. <laughs> last, year, last year, we served more than 1,200 student parents with more than 4,000 child care spots at 46 campuses. And I say, but we have 64 campuses. <laughs> Let's make sure that every one of our 64 campuses provides on-site child care facilities that are second to none so these parents can have one less thing to worry about when they're trying to better themselves. So we have been focused on this issue. My partners have been focused on this issue. And I'll close by saying this is personal to me, not just because I'm a mom, but because 34 years ago, I couldn't find child care. Daycares were just starting. There weren't many working moms. There's kind of a stigma against it. Oh, you mean you're going to work and not take care of your kids? Remember that? You're, you're all too young to know that. But that was the culture back then, right? That was the culture back then. But I had a passion. I had a, a, a thirst for public service. And I was working on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., where my babies were born. And I had to make that decision that it confronts way too many parents. No child care, nothing I could afford. The daycares were just starting up. They were kind of overpopulated, the ones that did exist. You couldn't get a slot. You can get a slot, maybe get on a two-year wait list. Okay, that doesn't really help you. So I had to leave my job. And it was hard. It affected our family finances when we went down from two workers down to one. You know, but I was fortunate to have a husband who could keep it going for me. A lot of people don't have that. A lot of people don't have that. I was blessed. We got through it. And so it's personal to me because I feel the stress that our families are under. I don't forget that stress. It encountered my life. We had to cut back all of our spending because we no longer had income for me and we had the expenses of a new baby with diapers and formula. Think about formula, the stress that people are dealing with. But is that sense of empathy and having been there that makes me feel even more passionate about the cause that we're talking about today? Because no woman should have to deal with the stress of making a decision when they want to work or they have to work and they just don't know who's going to take care of their baby. That hits you right here, right? That hits you right there. So now, in the state of New York, 
we have prioritized those babies and those children to make sure that they get world-class care. And they get it at places like this. I'm proud of that. I want to make sure that there's no child in the state of New York or no parent who ever has to worry about what happens to their babies. And I'm proud of our legislature for working with us. And I will conclude by saying we're just getting warmed up. When we find a problem, something that affects the families that I'm here to represent and care for, we will solve it for them. So thank you to the providers. All of you are here because you love children, you care about families, and you're out there doing what we all do in public service because you are a public servant in that sense. We take care of people. So thank you, and I'm very proud to welcome up to the stage right now another champion who feels as passionately as I do about taking care of our families, especially those in underserved communities that have been forgotten for far too long, and those days are now over. Senator Roxanne Prasad. Good afternoon and welcome to Senate District 19. Doesn't it feel good to be outside and, you know, we all can be in the same space and one and have fun and listen to some good news? So as the chair of the Social Services Committee in the Senate, I'm honored this afternoon to be here at HES. Um, HES, for many of us, is a place that we've been coming for many, many years, and HES is um, important to our community. So Governor Cuomo, thank you for... I can't believe I did that. <laughs> Governor Hochul, and I'll tell you the story of why that, why that name was in my head. I'll tell you the story. Thank you for being here in Canarsie. Thank you for being here at HES. Uh, to my colleagues in government, Assemblymember Jamie Williams, to Commissioner Poole, who we work together to ensure that the lives of families have improved from, the, you know, from where we started. You know, Governor Hochul here today is concerned about families. And why is she concerned about families? First, she's a woman who understands the issues of families. And by the way, everyone, she's a mom and she's a new grandmother. So can you give her a round of applause for being a new grandmother? You know, as New York's first female governor, she knows firsthand, firsthand. And every time she speaks, she speaks with the passion of someone who is dedicated to changing the lot and lives for families. Not too long ago, she was here in Brooklyn, and again, she was talking about changing the lives of families, not only in Brooklyn. I'm always happy when she comes to my district, but across the state of New York. Uh, you know, Governor Cuomo, I'm going to say Governor Cuomo. Governor Cuomo was not interested in this. And that's why that name was in my head. Governor Cuomo, we had asked for that. We had asked for the investment in families, and we had never gotten it. We had pleaded for the investment in families. Governor Hochul came on board, and she says, absolutely, this is what we need to do. How do we make the lives of the working mothers better? We have to make it better, and that's what she's dedicated to doing. She's also said, working moms, you know, they're going there, some of them, they're, they're, they're struggling, you know, they can't, they go to work and they're concerned, who's gonna take care of my child? And they have to leave work early. The employer is upset that they're leaving work early, right? And sometimes, for example, last night, someone came up to me and said, you know, I am so happy with the things you guys are doing in the childcare space. He says, my sister, her and her husband, they are struggling right now. And they are living in a part of New York that has a child care desert, that's considered child care desert, upstate New York. He said, she called me and says, I need help. I need help. She drives 45 minutes to her mom's house to leave a newborn baby before she drives to work. And then she leaves work in the afternoon, drives 45 minutes to get her baby and go home. So she's traveling in excess of three hours just to get child care because there's no child care in the area where she's living. Governor Hochul has decided we must change that narrative. No one in the state of New York should say there is no child care. 
And then we hear people say, well, there may be childcare, but it's not quality childcare. But that's why this investment, seven billion across four years, is going to change that narrative. It's going, no one will ever be able to say, I don't have childcare, or there's not quality childcare. That will never happen in the state of New York. As the chair of social services, I am extremely proud of what Governor Hochul has done in the child care space. It's about making families whole. That's all it is. And when you understand what families have gone through and the pandemic has shown us more than ever, the things that we were lacking, the things that were not our priority, that are now, we have now made it our priority. We have a commissioner who is dedicated to that also. And you have to make sure the people you're working with, that they buy into your mission and your vision. And all of us on this stage are working together to ensure that New York families are made whole. So I appreciate all of the child care providers who are here today. Across Senate District 19, we've compiled a list and we send, try and, to send as much information to keep them up to date as possible. That list comprises of over 150 child care providers. Many of them are covered by the Department of Education. But we are ensuring, and even with that number, there are still child care deserts within this district. Today, we are changing that. So to all of the child care providers, to Governor Hochul, to Commissioner Poole, to my colleague Assembly Member Williams, you know, thank you for everything that you are doing because today changes the lives of families across New York State. Thank you for being here, everyone. Please welcome to the podium Assembly Member Jamie Williams. Thank you. So first, I just want to say thank you to HES for hosting us um, this afternoon here. Thank you, Governor, for choosing Canarsie to be the platform to speak about childcare. And also thank you to the dynamic Shirley Paul, who made sure the governor came back to her home district to rule out this plan. So for me personally, this touches home. Um, I'm a mother of three girls, and many, many moons ago, when I decided to go back to school, um, at that time there was UPK, and I had to make sure that my children, you know, had the morning period, because UPK, you had a time slot from like 9 something to 11.30. So I would have to make sure that I did my classes around that time when my kids were in UPK, right, to be able to pick them up after and then go home to do my duties. So as a parent, it was definitely difficult to do that, to juggle my children, juggle um, school, and then, you know, I couldn't even go to work because I just couldn't do it because there wasn't adequate um, child care. And I'm so proud to, today to stand up because even though it was difficult for me. I know there is a future for moms like me who decided to go back to school or to even get a job or whatever they want to do to be a role model for their children. So I'm really, really happy with this opportunity. So I just want to say that, you know, with this child care service, it's very important for our economic vitality. It landmarks so many changes, and I hope as well we can also invest even more for parents with children with special needs, yep. right? So that's a step that we have to take in, in, in the future, but we are in the right direction for assisting mothers who are willing to go back to work and to do something with their lives. Um, with this initiative, it will make that possible. It will, right? For me, it was difficult, but I know, rest assured, with this new funding, it will change the lives of so many. So I just want to say thank you, Governor, and to Senator Prasad for doing all of this, and to our commissioner, thank you for advocating for our children and for our um, great state. So thank you so very much. Please welcome to the podium, Commissioner Sheila Poole. Good afternoon, everyone. You know, 
what better place could any of us be on a Friday afternoon than in a school with our fabulous governor, with our passionate legislators. How many of you are child care providers with our amazing providers here? I know I was so happy this morning when I woke up in Albany and I knew I was going to be with all of you along with my staff at OCFS here today. You know, we've all been through so much as, as you've heard everyone talk about, right? When the pandemic first hit our state, it's estimated that here in New York City alone, approximately 60% of child care programs closed, 60%. Many of you, right, as the governor referenced, found a way, right, knowing that the nurses and others, many others who were serving as essential workers that we needed to take care of COVID patients, you know, you did whatever it took. I've spoken with many of you and the heroic efforts of you, the sacrifices and risks for home-based providers that you took, right, when we didn't know a lot about COVID, still allowing children and parents to drop off because you knew that they had a job to do and you had a job to do. So I welcome any opportunity to echo our governor's thanks, our deep gratitude and thanks and recognition to a sector that is frankly all too often in the past been unrecognized for what you do for New York's economy, for our families and for our children. So thank you for all of that. And we asked you to do a lot, right? We asked you to put masks on kids. We asked you to, you know, use hand sanitizer, to modify your programs for social distancing. You're all nodding your heads. We asked you to do a lot. Um, but we also, fortunately, with federal pandemic funds, we were able to, and I'm so proud of the work of my team, Dr. Janice Molnar, who many of you know, and uh, Claudia from our regional office. I have, because the governor pushes all of us as commissioners, if you have money, get it out the door. Don't make it so difficult that right, we miss the opportunity when providers are desperately waiting for help. And last year when we issued our $1.2 billion stabilization program, how many of you were recipients of that? Yes? Some of you in the room. We were able to create a portal, right, where a provider would go in, click a couple of buttons, sign an attestation, and then almost within 15 minutes received an approval. And knowing that for the next six months, right, you would have an allotment of money go into your bank account. That's one example of how we have learned in government to try and to be more responsive and get money to you faster. And there's more. The good news is we will be soon, as the governor said, uh, issuing a second round of stabilization grants. We have heard loud and clear it's great to have had the funds to help us with our ongoing operating expenses, but we're really worried about our workforce and we need additional supports. Now, it won't be the solution for everything, as the governor said. There is more work yet to be done and we need to figure out ways of continuing to advocate on the federal level, right? We were all hopeful that Build Back Better would bring more permanent investments to states. Unfortunately, that is yet to pass, but that is really the permanent solution here to our national child care crisis. So we all have to keep up our advocacy on the federal, on the federal level. Um, I am just so grateful um, to all of you for the work that you've done, what you've continued to do. Uh, the advocacy is strong. I see Greg Bender um, here and a number of advocates. They hold me accountable. They hold legislators accountable. They hold our governor accountable because of the importance of child care. And I look forward as we are about to reconvene soon our second generation of the child care availability task force, which uh, when the governor was then lieutenant governor, you know, she was sort of the, the representative of the administration. She showed up. She showed up. The go lieutenant governor then would call me and say, Commissioner Poole, I'm still hearing a lot of noise from child care providers. What are we doing in that task force? Well, we are now, right, um, through the legislative language and the governor's own vision now as our governor, saying, come back to the table, everyone. We've got more work to do. Um, in the coming years. So I am so looking forward. I have the honor 
of co-chairing that task force, and I know some of you are participants on it, and I look forward to our work together. So thank you, more exciting things to come, and it's been a privilege being with all of you today.